Hey folks, how's it going? I just wanted to make a quick little short video here today and um you know for this episode of well and just you know touch on to a conversation that's being had and it's been had and it's being had and it's gonna be had more. And you know it's very interesting, you know, I have to look at it from you know my perspective, perspective of my family and just you know perspective of of, of you know being a black man in America and just really kinda tap into it a little bit. I haven't, I haven't spoke about it at all, but you know, today on Well, we're going to speak about it a little bit, and that's reparations. You know, reparations is a very important conversation. It's a very hot topic. I guess couldn't be a better conversation on a hot day like such as today. <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, you know, say, well, you know, reparations, you know, in, 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 from my per perspective, you know, I look at it like this, you know, from I go, you know, the studying of my family, you know, being someone who's who's been studying his family, you know, very intently for the past 15 years, you know, in depthly um, with my father, with my you know, cousins and, you know, just, you know, with my family, you know, we've been doing deep dives, researching you know, our history of our family, geology and just, you know, all the way back. Right. And you know, a lot of the things that we've learned has been very interesting, but the thing that's been most interesting to me is, you know, what I really garnered from my father's autobiography and from talking to him and talking to him on a daily basis, you know, at almost 87 years old, you know, his perspective is, is one of the most valuable perspectives, period, you know, especially on, on this, on this, on this black experience on, you know, being his son and, you know, seeing where he's come from to where he's at now and, you know, where we're going as a country, as a people, you know, it's very interesting and critical. You know, so when we talk about reparations, you know, everybody's got their point of view because there's not a, you know, specific, you know, um, version that makes sense to everybody. But and it won't be for a while until we really have the, the conversations and the discussions. Now, from my perspective, you know, I look at it, I look at it like this, you know, we start, you know, for for me. I look at my father being a um, 17 year old black man um, in 1954, America, Indiana, and joins the Air Force. And he goes from, you know, you know, it's during Jim Crow, so it's, it's, it's purely segregated. This is one of his, only like one of his second really, you know, major forays out into the world, into, into you know, into, into white America not being surrounded by, you know, um, black America where he's from, you know, because it was segregated. So he really didn't spend much time around white America. But as he, you know, went to, you know, got on, you know, he was on, he was on the bus, the Air Force bus and, you know, full of young men and they go, you know, you know, off to, off to boot camp, off to boot camp. And, you know, they all go to, you know, a diner, you know, stop at a diner, the, the bus stops at a diner and a drugstore and they go in and this is the first time he's met with now at 17 years old, mind you, in 1954, it's the first time he's met with, um, we don't serve you. You know, you can't, you can't buy from here because you know, you're black. We don't serve coloreds here. Okay. 1954. Now, you know, he's taken aback. He's taken aback. He's like, okay. So he goes, sets back on the bus and and the and the the young white airmen um that he was you know going to boot camp with they came and said you know you know hey montgomery that's not right um is there something we can go in there and get for you and this was his first real you know experience into you know the racial divide um at 17 in 1954 because you know he grew up in segregation you know where 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 you know, in, in where he grew up at, there was, you know, blue collar blacks and there was, you know, a few white collar blacks, you know, in Indianapolis, you know, um, around the avenue. And so this was his first real experience, you know, into dealing with um, the racial division and really experiencing the coming to understand, you know, what segregation really looks like and means. Now, as he, you know, went into his military experience, you know, there was there was more stories like this, whether it be down in Mississippi in Biloxi, Mississippi, you know, when, 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 um, you know, he was in, in town, you know, on, um, on, um, you know, a break and, um, with, with three other, um, black soldiers or airmen. And, and one of the, one of the guys that he was with, um, whistled at a, at a young white lady. 
And a few minutes later, the police pulled up and, and gathered all three of them up. And, um, you know, um, immediately, immediately, you know, took them over to the judge's um, house. And there was a group of people there and they immediately um, held court immediately, just like that. And found his friend um, admitted he was the one that whistled at her and he was sentenced immediately to a work farm, you know, in the military. Um, couldn't even, you know, um, um, save him from being, you know, um, um, you know I, at that time, save him from being um, sentenced to a, a, a work farm. Now, the, the military eventually, you know, came and retrieved him from the work farm and um and I think he um got dismissed from the military after that, but that was one of the one of the stories that he tells. And so, and this is all around the same time, you know. Shortly thereafter, when he left Biloxi, this was shortly thereafter he left Biloxi was um 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 when Emmett Till got killed. So this is all occurring, you know, in the same proximity of time and same proximity of area. But I'm saying all this to say, you know, this is this is my father, you know, who 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 raised me, and this is his experience clear up um, to now. And so when we look at reparations, you know, I, I look at his military pictures. I look at his pictures from when, you know, he was 17 and 18 and when he was, you know, going through um, 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 boot camp and everything. And I look at, I look at the guys he was with. I look at the guys he was with and there was, it was probably about, it was probably about, you know, 90, 97%, you know what I'm saying? Um, 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 white airmen, and about 3% black airmen. And and I look at that picture and I just wonder, and I look at those pictures because it's multiple pictures. I just wonder, you know, now they're all in the same situation at the same time, the same age, being taught and trained the same things and learning the same things. But, you know, I, I often wonder, I know, knowing what I know now, how, you know, our system being set up and skewed, you know, with systemic racism and, you know, with, 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 like to say, this was Jim Crow at the time, you know, how how different the trajectory of their lives went as opposed to my father's. And so, you know, I look I look at that and I and I and I tend to wonder. Now, that's this is just a little bit from my own perspectives, my own perspective when it comes to, you know, reparations, because it goes even further back. I look at my grandfather, look at his parents, look at my grandmother, look at her parents. I look, you know, you know, all the way back to we trace back to when, you know, when, you know, to one, you know, when when. When when um, one of our ancestors, you know, um, I think it was let me see, great great, probably third third great back um, was um, released from slavery, and and even where we got our name from, you know, and even where you know, you know where our origins are from, and and you know I look at that, and so when I think about reparations, I can directly trace to a place and do a you know genealogical trek all the way back to that particular place and say okay you know i should be able to you know tap into the legacy from here 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 in my family all the way up to now and due to systemic racial institutional racial you know um um issues and and separations and segregations that we faced and face you know, there should be some form of, you know, um, of bar barrier removal for one, you know, barrier removal, meaning, meaning, you know, lands that we once held, possessed and owned that we lost due to, due to, you know, um, um, financial institutions that we lost due to, you know, due to systemic racism. You know, if we, you know, even investigate those parts. You know, just on and on and on, you know, and when we when we really, you know, do the calculations, just, you know, just my own personal experience. When we do the calculations, you know, we come to some substantial dollars. Now, that's just one me. That's just one. You know, when we do this, you know, from 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 from, you know, descendants of slavery to descendant of slavery to descendant of slavery, you know, on and on and on and on and on. And we really do the research and we do, you know, we go back and we really see, you know, we start to see and develop a picture of what reparations should and should not look like. Now, here's the thing. You know, a lot of people are concerned about us getting cash payments in our hand. Here's the thing. 
you know, I can honestly say, honestly say, honestly say, you know, and this has been a kind of a, a battle of a conversation for the past few years, but, you know, financial literacy. Now, financial literacy is valuable. It's very important. I'm more concerned about economic literacy, which there's two different things, a lot of similarities, but economic um, literacy. But here's the thing. I, I, I definitely know for a fact, you know, that most black people I know are more financially literate than anybody. How do I know? Because they do way more with way less. You know, we've done way more considerably, way more and existed for way longer with way less money. And we've, you know, we've managed to, you know, to carve out a, a, a lot, even though we've lost a lot specifically due to race. That's the thing, you know, specifically due to race, not because we were financially illiterate, not because we did not know how to manage money, not because <laughs> so forth and so on, so forth and so on, not because, you know, we were, you know, you know, derelict with 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 the finances that we had. Now, some people are. That's true. Even to this day, you know, some people are, but some people are of every race, you know, derelict with their with their finances. Believe me when I tell you, that's just that's just reality. So that's not, you know, but most of the black people that I know. I'm not even going to look at everybody else, just in my family, very financially, very fiscally responsible, very extremely, you know, everybody, matter of fact, more than not, you know, I mean, the, the largest percent of, of my family is financially literate at a high level because they do way more with way less, you know, they do way more with way less and they've done it for so long and they manage money better than anybody any any better than any corporation my father he's a, he's a he's a dynamic account even to this day even to today you know he does more he does more logging and count he counts he he does way more with way less you know only one that does any more with way less is god almighty you know but you know i'm saying all this to say when it comes to financial literacy you know cash payments would be you know would be phenomenal but in order to do that, you know, um, we have to re start to remove a lot of the systemic barriers that are precluding um, us even holding on to. You know, I, when we came to Indianapolis in 1984, you know, um, I saw black businesses for the first time in my life. I did. I'm from Colorado. Um, there wasn't a lot of, you know, the only black people in Colorado that I knew were actually my family, to be honest with you. Honestly, I mean, they're not for the most for 99 percent. Um, but when I moved to Indianapolis, you know, for the first time I saw black, black businesses, black neighborhoods, you know, um, black infrastructure, you know, a lot of, you know, and, and, and we would go, we would go and patronize a lot of black businesses a lot, you know, from Mr. Wilson's bike shop to, you know, to, to, to Jerry's, um, 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 convenience store, you know, to, to Bob, it's, um, um, gas station to on and on and on and on, and on you know, just on and on. I never, I never saw it before. And to see it, you know, to see it and see it thriving and to see how it, you know, really, you know, you know, um, was a staple, the staples in the neighborhood, you know, and I say that specifically because they're all gone now. They're all gone. I've saw them, I saw them, I saw them. And, and now at this age, I understand, you know, how hard it is to maintain a, a, a business without, without, without access to, 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 to capital. Now I'm going to tell you right now, these individuals that I named were very shrewd with money, very shrewd with money. They, they, they were very dynamic and they provided t way more service to the community than, than, than I don't think anybody can, I don't think anybody can deny the level of services that they provided to the community. And the fact that, that those businesses, those buildings are there, and I, you know, and the buildings that are still there are vacant and empty and, you know, and, and there's no infrastructure for them to maintain it, for the families to maintain it. And it breaks my heart and just all over everywhere. And this is just Indianapolis, just, you know, this is every major metropolitan area in the country. Same story. So, you know, one of my focuses, you know, and I say, well, you know, one of my focuses is to help build sustainable business, not just for black businesses, but for all businesses, for everybody. But when it comes to reparations, we need to start having a dynamic conversation and understand, you know, here's the thing. This is not a, a, a bargaining chip to, to bargain, you know, and nobody's going to give us anything but what's owed. And that's the thing. But what's owed, you know, we could do the research. We could do the, you know, and 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 just, you know, the, lay it, lay out the data. Let's let's just do that. Let's just put the data on the table and let the data speak. And then we attach the money. And because the bottom line about it is this money's owed. 
It's money's owed, not given. It's money's owed. But it's a but it's a conversation that we need to start having, though. So you know, so I, say, I say, well, you know, let's start let's start the conversation. You know, have a conversation. Reach out to me. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a, have, have a dialogue. Let, you know, let's do an interview. You know what I'm saying? Let's sit down and, you know, let's get it recorded and let's put it out and let's start having a conversation, you know, about reparations because there's a lot of factors involved. This is true. A lot of factors involved, a lot of ways it should be done, a lot of ways it shouldn't be done, you know, but the reality of it is, is we have to really start, you know, delving into, you know, you know, the reasons for what, for and why and how. Because, you know, it's way past time. And, you know, I'm just I'm, I'm excited about a lot of things right now. Um, there's a lot of things to worry about. I'm more worried about, you know, how people are not, you know, really tapping into this economic um, literacy. But, you know, one of my goals is to, you know, help everybody I can, you know, um, get their economic literacy up and, and really start to understand the importance of entrepreneurship and you know business ownership and just ownership in general. You know, we have to, you know. It's not enough to get it. We got to keep it. We got to keep it and say, well, you know, so let's have a conversation. Hopefully this makes sense. You know, let's, you know, tap in, you know, reach out to me and let's have a conversation. We'll talk to you later. God bless you. Well.